I want to share just a, a few announcements. Again, we are glad to have you in service today. And um, on the podium, if you did not walk by it on your way in, you'll find, again, that list, that schedule of, of what our services are between now and the end of August. And then also, uh, there's a, a basket sitting there, and there's some cards already in it, but Miss Helen Harper's birthday is Tuesday this week. She'll be 99. And if you would like to bring a birthday card for her, you can leave it in that basket. Or if you'd just like to write her a note and leave it, you're welcome to do that. We'll be taking those no later than Tuesday. So we'd like to ask that you bring them today sometime if you can. Um, in the back of your, your pew there in the book holder, you'll find a yellow piece of paper. That is a church calendar. We haven't put one of those out for the last couple of months. But that's there for you to take and take home with you. And it's got a few announcements concerning the church, but then our birthdays and anniversaries are listed there as well. Tonight at 6, we will have our Sunday school classes that continue on, and we encourage you, if you've not taken a part of those, if you feel comfortable coming, we encourage you to come and be a part of those studies as we uh, grow closer to the Lord and uh, learn in wisdom and knowledge uh, about His Word. Also Wednesdays, we have 10 o'clock service and 7 o'clock service and we invite you to be a part of those as well. Yesterday, we had mentioned last week, yesterday was our Arkansas Free Will Baptist State Meeting. And uh, state meeting went well. It was unique. Uh, typically, we take about two days, and we done it all in two hours yesterday. So uh, we condensed everything down. We did, in the process, approve a state budget for 575000 which included a missions budget of 135000 And I want to Thank you as a church. Uh, you contribute over 40000 to that uh, every year. And we appreciate what you do, not only for the local church, but also as we think about uh, sharing the gospel statewide and nationwide. And so we thank you for your support and continued contributions with that. Also, to just kind of keep in mind, we ask you to be praying about this. World Missions Offering is August the 30th of this month. And uh, that will be where our church has the goal of 10000 that day that will be sent directly to World Missions in order for them to keep missionaries on the field, keep their accounts positive so that they can stay and continue to share the gospel in countries around the world. Here locally, yesterday, there were over 400 students that received a backpack, the, the Backpack to School program that our church has been a part of for many years and uh, you contributed composition notebooks to that, a thousand of them, and there were 400 students that received uh, at least a portion of those, so we're thankful for what you have been faithful in contributing to that. And then uh, one last thing for deacons and trustees, we will meet this Tuesday, our monthly meeting, uh, deacons at 6 o'clock and trustees will join in at 6.30, so if you're able to be here, we would enjoy you being here and being part of that meeting. Also, if you have a question for a deacon or trustee, please see them uh, prior to Tuesday's meeting, and we would be glad to, to answer or discuss anything that, that you would have on your mind concerning that. Anything else that needs to be said this morning? Okay, I'm going to ask you to stand one more time. As to, we look today and think about just our worship of the Lord, part of that worship is actually our prayer time. And one of the things that the disciples ask for was uh, Christ to teach them how to pray. We find this in Luke chapter 11, also in Matthew chapter 6 it's recorded. And we find that the, the Lord's Prayer we refer to it as. And so I want us to begin service by just um, stating that prayer, praying that prayer uh, together this morning. We will be preaching about the first few verses of that today. So just to set our hearts and our minds as we go through our music service on what we will be looking to concerning God's Word, we ask that you join in. Uh, Josh, if you would go ahead and put that up. We're going to be reading from the King James Version, so we can all uh, read along there. It should be on your right as you look to the screen. And uh, we would ask that you join in, but not just repeat the words, but let's pray this in our heart. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Brother Delbert, if you would come and lead us this morning. And you may be seated, I believe. Okay. I'm back with the early birds this morning. We're going to start out with the lily of the valley.
And for our last one, uh, Footsteps of Jesus. Sing all four and let's uh, stand on the last verse, please. Gene Schaefer, would you lead us in prayer, please? seated. Well, if you want to turn in your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 11, we're going to take our text from there. While you're turning there, there are many who live in certain places around the world that enjoy the beauty of God's creation. Those that that may live in the mountains of Colorado or close to the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee um, are surrounded by the beauty of nature that God created. However, those that grow up in those areas sometimes miss that beauty because they become accustomed to it being there every day. Now, we also live in an area that have as many beautiful locations, but because we live here and we drive by them every day, sometimes we miss the beauty that God has placed all around us. And I think that's true in a lot of different areas, not just scenery and concerns of nature, but there's a beauty among the fellowship of people together. And I think maybe we noticed this a little bit when we did have to shut services down and we went for a period of time without being able to gather together. And we missed that fellowship of brethren among each other. And there is a beauty among that of 
of the body of Christ coming together and, and worshiping together, but even just fellowshipping together. Sometimes we become very accustomed to things that, that have been in our life, almost all of our life, and so we miss the actual intended importance of it being there. If not cautious concerning the Lord's Prayer, we can become sayers of that prayer and really truly miss the beauty of what Jesus was teaching the disciples when they had asked for a lesson on how they should pray. There was this example that Christ gave or this instruction that he gives was not meant to be the only way or the only structure on which they were to pray. As we see in other portions of the Gospels where Prayer was more to the point about a specific need. And you might remember Peter when he had stepped out of the boat and was walking on the water and he began to sink and he cries out to the Lord, Lord, save me, which was a very heartfelt prayer. And Christ heard and Christ answered that prayer. So this is not the, the only structure, but this is a structure that Christ gave us and there's a beauty in this structure. It does provide logic also for our daily prayer time. And, and as we value God in our life and as we value the importance and the, the majesty of him and just the, the awe that we should have of God, the Lord's Prayer gives us that example. And Christ instructs his disciples that this is a model or a structure in which we should have that close communion with our Heavenly Father. Notice from Luke chapter 11. I want to begin in verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 13. We're not going to talk about all of these today, but I just want us to read the context of what Christ was presenting here. Verse 1 says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? I believe it's such an important verse, that verse 13, that defines exactly what a good gift is, that being the presence of the Holy Spirit within our life. We sometimes miss that, and we think about other things being good gifts, and, and some of them are. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift we can ever receive. Would you join with me in a word of prayer this time? Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you again. We thank you for this day and, Lord, for your many blessings and the, the blessing you give us of just that Holy Spirit that dwells within, that get, provides guidance to us. And, and, Lord, even now as we sit and we study your word, helps us to understand and see things that you would have us to see out of your word. Lord, we pray that we be attentive to it. And we ask this in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I want us to look at, at three different points here, really out of about the first three verses uh, today. 
And first, I want us to notice that as Jesus begins this instruction to the disciples, and by the way, you'll notice the, the way the prayer is recorded here in Luke chapter 11 is not word for word as how Matthew chapter 6 records that. Luke records what we might say is the basics of the prayer. Uh, Matthew recorded more of a word for word type um, instruction on that prayer. So we see the, the meaning is not different, it's just the, the, the basics, and, and then Matthew expands upon that. But notice as Jesus begins this instruction to the disciples on how to pray, he begins with the acknowledgement of whom we are to address in our prayer. Now that seems very basic, but yet it is oh so important. He does this, and he expresses this to the disciples by addressing God as Father. Now, we look at that today, and it seems just normal for us to say Father or Heavenly Father. Being in church maybe most of your life, you've heard God addressed in that way from the time you first walked in the door, probably. But in Jesus' culture, God was looked at as the Creator Father, the one to whom they owed their very existence. We see this on display in the Old Testament by the number of times that they referred to God as Father. In the entire 39 books of the Old Testament, God is referred to as Father only 14 times. In 39 books, referred to 14 times as Father. And it was a rather impersonal reference every time. When they referenced God as Father, they were referring to Him being the Father of the Israelite nation, not the Father individually of them. As Jesus came on the scene, and especially as He taught the disciples here, He addresses God as Father and is recorded as referencing God as Father more than 60 times in the four books of the Gospel. Sometimes the implication or meaning of a word or a name can get lost in the translation. So I want us to take it a further step. And, and Jesus actually used the word in Aramaic. The word is Abba. And you've heard this before. Abba Father. Spoken of by individuals. Abba is a very common informal word with which a child would address his father. In fact, in all of Jesus' prayers in the New Testament, with the exception of one found in Matthew 27, we find him use the word Abba. In Matthew 27, Jesus cries out from the cross, though, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In which he was actually quoting from Psalm chapter 22. But with his final words that he gave upon the cross, Jesus reverted to the word Abba for Father. He also used the word Abba to address his earthly father, Joseph. And again, it was a very common, informal word in which the way a child would address his father. Everyone used the word, and the best description of its meaning in today's time would actually be the words, Dearest Father. So as Christ approached God in prayer, and as he teaches the disciples to approach God in prayer, he begins by saying, address him as dearest father. To the Jew that Jesus was teaching how to pray, this was unheard of to refer to God as dearest father when in the entire Old Testament he was referred to as father only 14 times and then it was as a corporate father of Israel. Not a dearest father, such as an earthly father. Jesus was teaching and he was modeling that the relationship with God was no longer a distant corporate experience, but it was an intimate one-on-one -on -one bond between a follower of Christ and God the Father or the dearest father. It makes me wonder today when we approach God what is our mindset? Do we approach him as a corporate father of the church, which he is? 
but individually having that Holy Spirit living within us? Do we approach Him as a dearest Father that is a close relationship to us? One that we would confide our very existence and our very thoughts and our very personal life with. Does God seem like this dearest Father to us, one that we would grow closer to each day? And not only each day, but with each prayer. Or does it seem like we're praying to a God that is distant and far away? Addressing God as our dearest Father is an indication of our spiritual health, but also a mark of our authenticity of our faith. Note what Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 8, in verses 15 and 16, Paul says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, notice this, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness that our spirit, with our spirit, that we are children of God. As true believers, we are compelled to cry out to God as our dearest Father throughout our everyday life. A few years ago, prior to us moving here to Pocahontas, the house that we lived in needed a new roof. And so I decided one summer that it would actually be a good learning project for Matthew and Michael, our two boys. And so we decided that we would tear off, or I decided, and they got to join in, that we would tear off all the shingles from the roof and then we would re-roof it ourselves. Now my timing is not always perfect and we decided to do this in the middle of July when it was nice and warm and they enjoyed that very much. But during the course of that time, they learned a lot of things. And one of the things that I impressed on them, because we wanted it to look well, was that we needed to keep all the shingles, the line of them, straight as we were putting them back on. And so there were, um, we had Matthew and, and, and Michael working together, which if you have a brother and you remember some of your younger days as a brother, sometimes that doesn't always work out exactly the way you want it to as a father. So there was a little bit of discussion that happened every once in a while. And one of the things was usually about whether they were straight or not. And after a few minutes would go by, I would hear Michael usually cry out and say, Dad, I think we're crooked again. And his mind was, Dad, I need you to come look at this because I want you to help us with it. And I never thought about it much until I was looking at this this week and And I thought, you know, Michael cried out because he knew there was someone that could get them where they needed to be. He had trust because there was a relationship that had been developed many years prior to that. I wonder, is this the way we approach God today? where we've developed a relationship over many years. And so with the very minute things or things that seem to be minute in our life, we can approach God and have that confidence that he is the one that's going to get us where we need to be. You see, that's the relationship that God desires with his people. That whether it be a straight line on a roof or whether it be how we approach someone that we need to talk to, that we cry out to God. Dearest Father, will you help us in our time of need? Secondly, Jesus identified God as as the dearest of fathers, but he instructed his disciples to pray for God's name to be hallowed. Now to hallow God's name means to set his name apart as holy or to treat it as holy. Now, our speech should reverence God's name as being of the greatest importance to our souls. His name should never be misused, and it, it bothers me today when I hear His name being misused. We should speak of Him often. God should come up in our conversations with no matter who we are talking about. 
So we should speak of His name very often, but never in a way that would bring shame to Him. In other words, as we address our dearest Father, we should pray that we never speak or through action show disrespect to Abba or our dearest Father. In much the same way that that we should conduct ourselves in our speech in a way that would honor our earthly mother and father, we also should conduct ourselves and our speech as followers of Christ and children of the dearest Father in a way that would honor Him with all that we do and all that we say. His name gets thrown around today as a byword many times. And what a shame. Would we throw our own Father's name, our earthly Father's name around as a byword? Probably not. And if we did, those around us would probably not look upon us very favorably. So I'm not sure why we get the idea, and I'm not saying you, I'm just saying culture. I'm not sure why culture gets the idea that we can throw God's name, Abba, our dearest Father's name, around as a byword. Thirdly, this morning, the last portion of the prayer that we're going to look at today is that of the petition for your kingdom to come. Now, based on an understanding of the tense of the original text, the word comes, or the word come, your kingdom come, refers to a decisive time in the future when the kingdom of God will come once and for all. This kingdom coming should be at the center of all of our prayer and all of our prayer throughout our life that we would desire the kingdom of God to actually come. This speaks of a a definitive time in the future, but also based on Matthew's recording of this and the statement, thy will be done, it tells us that this is also speaking of God's will not only being accomplished when Jesus returns, but also being accomplished at this point in time. Thy will be done when Christ returns, but also in this moment in time today. If we are a part of the kingdom of God today, then we will strive to do His will, which means we have to direct or redirect our will to His. This is the essence of repentance. And we talk about in our our Christian circles or in church today that repentance is so important. And we think about repentance as being acknowledging our sin and turning away from it. But I'm not sure that we think of it in the sense of aligning God's will with ours. But it's the very essence of repentance. Not that I would go against God's will, which is sin, but that I would do God's will, not only when Christ returns, but I would do His will even in this moment in time today. Sometimes that means that we must change our direction. Sometimes it means we begin following His way for our life instead of our own. But it's not only a a prayer of repentance, but it's also a prayer of commitment. To pray that God's kingdom come is to commit ourselves to keep following Him regardless of the obstacles or the direction that He may be taking us. And I don't know about you, but sometimes God is taking me in a very uncomfortable direction. But when able to look back in hindsight, I've always seen that it was for the best in my life. I didn't think so at the time. I wasn't comfortable with it at the time. But when I look back and I evaluate where God was taking me, what He was wanting me to learn what he was needing me to be able to do in this world, then I find that his direction is always perfect. It doesn't mean that I always follow it perfectly, but our desire should be that we follow it perfectly. 
You see, it's a statement also of committing to pursue the kingdom above all else. There's a lot of things in this world that that we strive for. Uh, One of the things hopefully we strive for is to actually honor our earthly father and our earthly mother. It's a commandment from God. It should be something that we do. I think we should strive here on earth to, to be able to provide for our, ourself when, when, poss- when at all possible. Not that we develop a, a self-righteous or a self-promoting, but so that we may be able to contribute back to the world and contribute God's message to the world without depending upon others. When we think about this prayer of pursuing the kingdom of God above all else, our earthly desires must be set aside in order for us to be able to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. I don't know of any of us that would desire for someone that we love and we care for or even for ourselves to end up with some sort of of physical illness that is debilitating. And we don't understand why those happen sometimes. We know we live in a broken world. But if those things should befall us, our greatest thing to turn to God with is to ask for His will to continue to be done regardless of what state that we find ourselves in, which may mean we have to redirect our will toward His. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You see, regardless what comes to us in this world, we should continue to seek God's kingdom God's will first in our life we can't pray the Lord's prayer and ask for his kingdom to come and then sit on our hands and do nothing it's a call to action and that call to action is to pursue righteousness through Jesus Christ our Lord but it has to be in accordance with his will and sometimes that means setting aside the things that we desire things that we think would look good but in God's will are not where he wants us to go or do. We can't pray the Lord's Prayer and then desire to do our own will. What a privilege we have. And the privilege that we have doesn't exist in other religions, but to be able to be instructed by our dearest Father, to call out to our dearest Father and enjoy a close, intimate, and secure relationship that we can approach Him with anything in our life. There's no other religion that has that. Of course, we know all other religions are false. But in the religion of of God, the Father, Abba, as we're looking at today, we know that we have the great privilege of approaching His throne through the Son, Jesus Christ. And if we truly understand the closeness and the relationship that we have with Abba, our dearest Father, then we will present God's good news of Jesus Christ, the Savior to a world that is looking for a home and a relationship that they can trust. And if we truly believe that God is the dearest Father, then we will want the world to know about Him. And that world means our neighbor that may be sitting beside us. Monday through Saturday, and sometimes sitting beside us on Sunday. We may desire the return of Christ to come and come quickly. There are days when that seems like the greatest thing that could happen. But we live daily under the instruction and the guidance of God's will for our lives today. And we look forward to the time of the return of Christ. And if it happens to be today, then amen, let it happen. But if it's not today, then amen, let God's will be done today. I 
I wonder, thinking about what we've looked at today, can we pray this prayer? It's going to be on your, on your, your screen to follow along. But can we pray this in our heart today? Dearest Father, in whom I find security and in whom I enjoy a close one-on-one -on -one relationship with and through Jesus Christ. I ask that you help me to never bring dishonor to your name and always cherish this close relationship as being the most important that I will ever have. I look forward to the day when Jesus will return, but I realize that until then, your will is for me to follow your instruction and your guidance for my life as I interact and live my life in a way that would bring others to a place where they would also call you, dearest Father. Can we pray that today? And not only today, but can we pray that every day? Can you say that each day you strive to honor and, and prevent dishonoring Him while cherishing and clinging tightly to the dearest Father that can help no matter what the situation of life may be? Can you say that you long for Christ to return and until then you long to see His will accomplished each day and are committed to helping accomplish that will? You see, to vainly repeat the words of the Lord's Prayer without understanding the meaning means that we are surrounded by His beauty but yet we can't see the forest for the tree. We miss the beauty of God while vainly repeating the words of something we may have learned as a child, but yet never really learned the heart of what Christ was teaching his disciples. Would you stand with me this morning as we approach the throne of God and we approach him not necessarily in a corporate way, but in a very personal way. As each of you is a believer in Christ, if you are a believer in Christ today, as each of you would approach him as your dearest father today. And as I lead us in prayer, you may, you may turn to him in ways that, that I never would know about or never will know about, but yet it's things that are so intimate in your life today that you need to just lay them at your dearest Father's feet. Maybe it's about the closeness or lack of closeness of your relationship to Him. Maybe it's about things going on in your life and just the striving to do His will daily as we long for the return of Christ. And maybe the Holy Spirit has placed someone on your heart and on your mind right now Someone that, that God has, has brought into your life and you've had opportunity to talk to them before, but you've just never fully done that. And maybe today you need instruction from your dearest father on how to approach them concerning their life and their relationship with him. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. And Lord, as we turn to you as as our dearest Father. Lord, as one that, that knows our very internal being, knows the heart of who we are. Lord, may we find the closeness to reveal that heart to you so that we also might fully understand the heart of who we are. Lord, no matter what may be in or present in our life today. May we find the comfort and the peace to, to approach you with it. Lord, that even though it may seem minor to some or, or it may seem unimportant to some, Lord, may we today just vocalize that to you 
And Lord, if, if there's things that you have been working on in our life, and, and Lord, we've just failed to acknowledge them, but you've been bringing them to our attention multiple times. Lord, today, we ask that we find the courage to be faithful in addressing those and acknowledging those and, Lord, in acting on those. Because, Lord, our desire is for your name to be glorified. And, Lord, we know that as we do your will, your name is glorified. Lord, just help us to be faithful to do that. Lord, we are so excited. We long for the return of your son. But Lord, in the time that you have tarried his return, Lord, we pray that we not become discouraged, but Lord, that we find it as another opportunity to be able to glorify your name and Lord, to promote the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in that. So again, that your name would be glorified. And Lord, today we pray that if there be one here who, who just is not in that relationship that you desire them to be, Lord, we pray that they would be able to call you, dearest Father, before they leave today. And Lord, if that means that there's a time where they need to come and pray, whether it be after service or, or with someone after service, Lord, we just pray that that they find that courage to do that. Lord, again, we thank you for this day. Lord, for our very breath of life, for the, the comfort that we have of being in your house this morning. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. And we pray this in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We appreciate you being here this morning. and. And we pray that as you leave today, that you might be able to say, He is my dearest Father. And that you find a comfort in approaching Him with any concern that you might have as you go throughout your daily life. And that you desire every moment of every day for His will to be done in your life. We hope you have a, a blessed rest of today. And we hope that in some way, not only do you find rest, but that you be a light to someone else today, whether it be if you go out to eat or whether it be in your neighborhood or to your neighbor or you have to go to the gas station, wherever it may be, but that you be a light to someone today so that they also might find rest in Christ. Have a wonderful day. Y'all turn and say hi and bye to each other and enjoy the fellowship with each one.